is The Chris Abraham Show. Welcome to Season 4, Episode 15 of The Chris Abraham Show. My name is Chris Abraham, and I am going to be talking today about what my points of pain are, and what my levels of suffering are, and what I expect in the world in terms of general environmental violence before I consider the world going to pot. And you'll be extremely surprised, but there are reasons for it. And um, I've even experienced a lot of it and completely normalized it as well. I'll be back after the break. Welcome back to the Chris Abraham Show. My name's Chris Abraham. It's season four, episode 15. Uh, And I am on about what I expect the world to be before I think that there is a civil war or before I believe that there is a revolution or before I believe that there is a fascist uprising or before I believe that democracy is dying or that our freedoms are infringed upon, or that the world is going to end. And my point of pain is probably a thousand X higher than yours, because all y'all think that a a civil war is coming, and I don't even see uh, skirmishes that uh, have anything to do with uh, the left or the right. I only see crime skirmishes. I never. I, I don't see any political skirmishes. Skirmishes. I don't see enough blood on the ground. I don't see enough bombing. And I certainly don't see a uh, discotheques and cafes being rocketed or bombed the way they are on a daily basis, or, or grocery stores are on a daily basis in in um, in Israel and Palestine. So, I guess that is my point of pain. Until I see skirmishes that are not crime-related, and I will go into an aside in a second, so I'll, um, I'll see you back here in a second. Welcome back to Season 4, Episode 15 of The Chris Abraham Show, previously known as Chris Cast. And when my buddy invaded Iraq with the army back in, whatever, 2003, he saw the collapse of Saddam Hussein, and Saddam Hussein was actually a... um, um, an author, 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 authoritarian peacekeeper. He was a, a, a maniac. His sons were terrifying, but he was able to turn a series of tribes into a nation state until we collapsed the government, killed Saddam, or had him killed by the people, the Volk. And... Um, And I'll be honest with you, um, from then on, there were two 
layers in in all of Iraq. There were uh, the um, Taliban and Al Qaeda and ISIS invaders. They were the cells that came in across the border. They were um, uh, fighters from Iran, from uh, from Syria, from around around the region. And they were fighting the American troops and the unified troops from, I guess, mostly America, but quasi-UN, quasi-Britain, quasi-Australia, quasi-Canada, etc. too. So my buddy said that there were two layers in Iraq, neither of which touched each other. The one layer was the war that was going on between uh, the insurgents from ISIS um and al qaeda and uh the royal the royal guard insurgents from from iran and against versus the the um western invaders uh the united states etc and then there was another layer which was just the tribes that had previously existed in a pre saddam Iraq and still existed based on families and so forth called from here forward warlords. So these warlords, these tribal warlords were having their very own skirmishes, skirmishes over land and over turf and over resources and over money and drugs and food and, and materials and weapons and ammo, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But it was completely separate. These were warlords. A lot of them did have the famous um, Hilux slash Tacoma uh, pickup trucks and so forth, but they weren't interested in defending uh, Iraq. They were interested in filling the vacuum that was left behind when uh, the government of Iraq, led by the family of Saddam Hussein, collapsed. So, Neither the twain should meet. Neither the twain did meet, unless they just happened to meet on the streets. Uh, but it was not their intention to try to rocket, attack, whatnot. In in many cases, there was a lot of gratefulness going on to the U.S. because the U.S. took out Saddam Hussein and his iron fist and allowed the entire nation state to dissolve into um, what it had always been for thousands of years, which is a patchwork of tribes and families going back thousands of years. So that changed, you know, uh, the entire region. America's a lot like that too. America has, you know, politics, it has police forces, it has national guards, it has state and local governments, it has all of this going on. But the warlords in the United States don't care about that. The warlords only have beef with other warlords. The warlords want to take turf. They, they're they warlords. When you see a drive-by crime in Chicago, that's warlord versus warlord. You could call it gangs, whatever, but it's gotten to the point where it's escalated that it's a military conflict. It's a military conflict that is on another layer of a military conflict. So I don't include that. I don't include um, street violence. I don't include street gun violence. I believe that that, is, that needs to be attacked by the FBI the way the FBI took out um, the Italian mafia and the gangs from the 20s and 30s. That is something we can do, but that's not political. That is not Democrat or Republican. That is a war against against the mafia. That is a war against gangland violence. That is a war against warlords. That is taking the streets back from 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 tribes. I mean, tribes, family gangs, all the same stuff. You could be beaten or you could be born in to a gang. And uh, that gang could be a monarchy, can be a um, Hussein family, can be um, a Bin Laden family, 
Or it can be, you know, Phi Kappa Psi or the Freemasons or uh, whatnot, right? So I do not include gang violence when I, when I think about uh, political unrest that would result in a civil war. The, um, the gangs can be used as an accelerant. I mean, it's really easy to use uh, all the, 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 the gang war violence, add that to uh, the gun crime and the mass shooting violence, but they have nothing to do with each other. There's no, um, there's no crazy proud boy or whatnot. And so my, I dismiss all gangland violence because all gangland violence should be under the control of the FBI and the FBI should be taking those people down, uh, whether they're MS-13 or whatever. Like, I don't care about their colors or their nationalities or their reasons for living. Um, I don't even care if that's, I mean, if, you know, if it doesn't affect me, right, not in my backyard, it doesn't seem to be affecting me, but it's killing a lot of kids, killing a lot of people in uh, impoverished areas, uh, which, you know, if you ever watch The Wire, um, these impoverished areas tend to be lawless and lawless areas are most attractive to gangs and gangland, gangland areas, etc. And at some point you'll think that at some point they'll transition to legitimate businesses like all gangs do. But for now, um, lots of people are dying, but they're not political. You can't even blame them on Soros or whomever. You can't. You can say that they're being used as a way to show lawlessness in America or as a way of illustrating uh, racism in America. And you can definitely say that any time anybody in a gang who is a person of color who's black or brown and engages in uh, fisticuffs or or shootouts with... Um, with the police and someone dies and that person is, you know, on the street, you can definitely politicize that, but it doesn't, it doesn't look at itself and see political, polit politicalization. It sees itself as, as business. And as far as I'm concerned, in a world where the only business you can really get, if you're, um, academically ignorant, if you don't actually care about the system and the system doesn't care about you, not stupid, not you can be a genius and still be ignorant i'm not referring to the ability to learn just the the appeal of learning um and learning being portrayed and this even happened in hawaii like when i was in hawaii all the local kids who were totally into becoming national merit scholars were called by all the the the, the general local kids they were called um, uh, bananas. They were called yellow on the outside and white on the inside. So as long as people hate white people in this country, and as long as academic achievement and cultural um, assimilation is equated with, with, uh, with being a, uh, an Uncle Tom, uh, as long as that happens then there's not going to be any desire to to follow that that track um that track so anyway back to uh the next step which is my tolerance for violence my tolerance for all kinds of things and I'll even go into January 6th a little bit but not too much be right back <laughs> Brass tax. Until my neighborhoods are politically, like, for example, the IRA, the Irish Republican Army, for example, um, uh, Hamas in uh, Jerusalem and Tel Aviv, um, and circa 1960 and 1970, uh, weather underground in the United States, until 
there are political bombings, political kidnappings, political attacks, murders, assassinations, drive-bys, and, uh, and blood flowing from automatic fire in the streets, I do not consider America even remotely close to civil war. Um, when I was 15 or 16 or 14 or 13, I was supposed to go to, um, to Spain to uh, spend a summer learning Spanish, Castilian Spanish. Um, and I think it was 85 when I was 15. And we ended up canceling it because there were, uh, there were bombings at discotheques or clubs, as you call them, at discotheques uh, all throughout Europe. I think maybe it was focused in Spain. Hey, Google. Were there bombings in Spain in 1985? Sure. Here's some helpful information I found on the web. So, uh, on 12 April 1985, the El, Desc El Descanso restaurant in Madrid, Spain was bombed in a terrorist attack. It was a bombing with impro um, improvised explosive device that killed 18 and injured 82. Um, this was happening all over Europe uh, in the 80s, in the 70s. Um, the IRA had bombings all over Great Britain, especially London. Huge bombings, shootings, kidnappings, assaults, assassinations. This is still happening in Central South America. That's why people are leaving uh, Nicaragua, Venezuela, Cuba, etc., right? I don't think Cuba is having a problem. I think it's more Salvador. I'm not sure if it's even uh, Venezuela and this kind of thing. I, but either way, I, I won't, I'm not remotely, I'm not even concerned by smash and grabs. I'm not that bothered by uh, manifest manifestations. Like when I lived in Germany, it was pretty common for people to just piss and moan by throwing pavement stones hither and thither. I think that um, we're very thin-skinned here, and I won't even start worrying about um, a civil war until there are skirmishes, right? With regards to January 6th, here's my poop. Nobody had a gun that was brandished. I don't believe the Department of Justice, whenever they said that there was a secret gun or secret pistol or secret bomb, double secret this, double secret that. All I see is a um, um, an attack on the Capitol that didn't have any guns, that didn't have any rifles, that didn't have any blood, except the blood that came from the face of of um, of the woman who was shot in the face. Hey, Google. What's the name of the woman who was shot on January 6th? Sorry, I don't know how to help with that. Ho, ho, ho. There are other things you can try. Hey, Google, who was shot on January 6th on the Capitol? I don't know, but I found these results on search. Really funny. I'm Ashley Babbitt. Ashley, hey, Google, who is Ashley Babbitt? Here you go. Born 1985, died January 6th, spouse uh, Aaron Babbitt, Timothy, uh, she had a couple movies, Christmas in Florida, education, El Capitan High School. She was... Ashley Babbitt was 36 years old when she died in 2021. The husbands of Ashley Babbitt were Aaron Babbitt and Timothy McKenty. Anyway, she was literally the only person who was shot there. I, I think everybody else had uh, died as a result of, of um, exertion, of anxiety, of, I mean, people were just beat up. We don't know how many people were beat up on either side, but I, I, don't, I don't really respect a, uh, I, don't, I don't respect a revolt uh, a, a, um, 
a coup d'etat that doesn't include a, a bombing, a, um, a huge gunfight, um, lots of people dying in... I, I have a, a theory that it has to be at least as violent as Les Miserables. And, uh, hey Google, how many people were killed at the barricade in Les Miserables? I don't know, but I found these results on search. The June Rebellion of the Paris Uprising of 1832 was an anti-monarchist insurrection of Parisian Republicans on 5 and 6 June. Uh, so there you go. That's uh, the June Rebellion. How many people died? Um, the uprising was over, uh, was over, resulting in the death or injury of around 10,000 people, including the deaths of about 1,500 troops and about 3,000 insurgents. Now that's a start. Like if that happened, and if it wasn't just sort of like a, uh, a puppet show, and then, you know what I mean? Like, um, it's, it's sort of, it sort of just feels fake and manufactured. I mean, I expected the Capitol building to be burned down or there to be extreme amounts of, uh, of foundational damage or an attempt to, uh, destroy, um, Hey Google, what rotunda was, was blown up, uh, in Berlin, uh, during the thirties? I don't know. But I found these results on search. I don't remember. Uh... Hey, Google, what was the false flag in uh, Berlin that started World War II? I don't know, but I found these results on search. Operation Himmler. Hey, Google, what's the name of the building in Berlin that has a glass top? I don't know, but I found these results on search. The Reichstag Dome. So, uh... Sorry, I can't send texts yet. Hey, Google, how was the Reichstag Dome uh, uh, destroyed? On the website history.com, they say, the Reichstag fire was a dramatic arson attack occurring on February 27, 1933, which burned the building that housed the Reichstag in Berlin. Now, People also sometimes ask me, what happened to the Reichstag dome? According to wikipedia.org, the ruined building was made safe against the elements and partially refurbished in the 1960s, but no attempt at full restoration was made until after German reunification on the 3rd of October 1990, when it underwent a reconstruction led by architect Norman Foster. Thank you. So, on that note, my tolerance for global violence is a lot higher. So, um, nothing happened after September 11th, you know, nothing really happened. Um, there was no follow-up bombing, no follow-up attack. Everybody talks about um, terrible cells flooding up through the border or there being um, political um, right-wing extremists. Like, nothing, nothing happened. January 6th, Complete, manif complete manufactured um, um, event. Uh, there, nobody, no police died there. People had uh, heart attacks and, and strokes and so forth afterwards, but that has a lot more to do with the fact that they were probably old or in poor shape. And honestly, if uh, all the police say that the terror there was worth, worse than happened than, than what happened in Iraq or Afghanistan, you should probably ask those Marines who were over, who were blown up at the, uh, um, the Kabul airport, uh, during the, uh, during the, uh, escape, um, from, um, from Kabul, the, the, uh, retreat from Kabul that we, that Biden led. Hey, Google, what is the name of the event where the Marines were blown up in Kabul? Um,
On the website npr.org, they say, a year ago, 13 Marines and more than 100 Afghans died when a bomb exploded at the Kabul airport. Stories from the frenetic last days of the American evacuation are still coming out. Mary Louise Kelly, host, one year ago today, 13 service members and more than 100 Afghans died when a bomb exploded at the Kabul airport. People also ask me, where were Marines deployed in Afghanistan? On the website marinecorptimes.com, they say, the Marine official confirmed that the roughly 1,000 Marines with the battalion landing team deployed from the MEU to Kabul. Um, it goes on to say, um, those Marines were the first on the ground at the airport, keeping the vital lifeline open for vulnerable Afghans attempting to flee and any U.S. citizens who remain in the country. Now, that is terrible. They, they wouldn't have to make, they, they, you wouldn't have to convince anybody in America over, um, over congressional, you know, congressional kangaroo court after congressional kangaroo court. If, if something terrible happened, like what, like this, like what happened at the Reichstag fire or at the, uh, Kabul airport, or at uh, Tel Aviv and Jerusalem on a daily basis, or on the West Bank, or during 60s, 70s, and 80s London and, and uh, Northern Ireland, or um, um, a daily basis happens in, um, in Syria, then, my God, I would believe that we were very close to a civil war. But... Um, my pain threshold is extremely high, and maybe I'll tell you why in a second. Hey, welcome back. This is almost over. I know it sucks. This is a terrible thing to know about me, how uh, how how much um, callous I have and maybe how jaded I am. Or if you look at it this way, I look at the world through through um, 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 uh, through rose colored glasses like I really am grateful about how extremely safe and how extremely gentle, and how extremely friendly, and how extremely civilized, and how extremely effortless it is to live in, uh, in America. You know, I'm extremely grateful that um, back in the 80s and 70s, my mom and dad had friends from New York City who moved back to Israel and they were always having problems with their uh, green grocer, their farmers markets, their public buses, and their um, and their cafes getting blowed up. Um, my mom and dad also told me about uh, uh, the sixties and seventies in Manhattan, where their favorite Italian restaurant owner was constantly being beat up because he wasn't paying he you know he was pissing off the mafioso who 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 protected the blocks and he was unwilling to pay them or couldn't pay them and they would beat the crap out of him and you know I'm sort of used to 70s lawless New York uh, I also lived uh, on Capitol Hill from 1996 until 2007 and Every night I would hear gunshots in my neighborhood. I mean, now it's completely gentrified, but there'd be gunshots all the time. There'd be dodginess. There'd be police. There'd be ambulances. Like, this is just the way the world is. And it could be a lot worse. I mean, I dare say America's not first world. America's never been first world. If you've ever been to Manhattan or San Francisco, you, you know that. Uh, it's always been second world. It, it started off as third world. We were merely 
if you will, uh, farmland, uh, farmland, and uh, and farmland and mines for the rest of the world. We were basically uh, Africa. America was Africa before Africa became Africa, uh, before China became America. Uh, we were the places you could get oil, gas, coal, uh, timber, lumber, same thing. Um, you know, cattle, chickens pork, wheat, etc., etc., etc. Like we were the breadbasket of America, not just in terms of our diversity of peoples, but in terms of the fruit and wine and all those other things. So um, we've always been that sort of agricultural class rather than elite class. You'll find elite people here, but you'll find elite people in uh, third world developing quote unquote shithole nations as well. Uh, you can tell you're in a, in a second world country uh, or in a third world country by how much protection there is to get to the rich people. Every year it's getting worse. We've got favelas now. They're not called favelas. They're called tent towns or whatnot. But, you know, there's still a way to go. Um I'm six foot three and three hundred and thirty pounds, so I live, and and I look poor. I dress poor. I act poor. I wander around in t-shirts and shorts. I'm a, 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 a an ambling fool of a guy. Uh, nobody could ever think that I have anything, and I probably don't. But I've never been mugged. All my friends have been mugged. You know, my tolerance for this kind of chicanery. Hey Google, what does chicanery mean? Here's the definition of chicanery. The use of trickery to achieve a political, financial, or legal purpose. Wow, I'm smarter than I thought. Anyway, on that note, what is your tolerance for, for, for terribleness? I mean, that's why I'm pretty okay, you know what I mean? Like with, with all sorts of, of risks, probabilities, etc. Like I think that in, I think that nuclear power is a viable risk. I think that uh, I'm way less risk averse than most people are. And that's another thing as well. Anyway, guys, I'll come back with some information how to contact me. I hope you love the episode or hate the episode. And either way, please let me know. Welcome back, welcome back, welcome back, welcome back. This is season four, episode 15. Quince? Onze, douze, treize, quatorze, quin, quinze, quinze, quince? Elf? Uh, anyway, I don't know. Um... You can reach me at chris at abraham.su. You can call me at plus one two zero two three five two five zero five one. That works with text calls. That works with WhatsApp, uh, Telegram, and Signal. You can uh, schedule a call at calendly.com slash chrisabraham slash 15. You can leave your hat on. You can find me at youtube.com slash chrisabraham, chrisabraham.com, linkedin.com slash in slash chrisabraham, twitter.com slash chrisabraham, instagram.com slash chrisabraham, chris-abraham.com, which is my Tumblr, and that might be it. Love you. Mean it. Talk to you soon. Auf Wiedersehen. Choose, choosy. 
Um, hasta luego, hasta mañana. Merci beaucoup. A demain, a tout à l'heure, a bientôt. Aloha, mahalo, and take care. Thank you for listening to The Chris Abraham Show. Make sure you subscribe so you don't miss any future episodes. Until next time.